Um, hello. Um, hope everybody's back in and can hear me well. Do a sign if you can't hear anything or if you're having trouble. But otherwise, uh, I'll start. Um, so now um, we're going to have uh, the Vina uh, Falcão for her workshop. I'm just going to do another remind, reminding everybody of the rules. Please mute yourself when you're not talking. Be respectful to others when they're talking. Um, silence your phone. Stay present, especially in the more interactive part of the workshop. And specific to this session, um, we're going to have two components, a theoretical one and a hands-on part. And doing the theoretical component, please either write your questions in the chat or um, keep them in your mind until the end of this theoretical component, and then you can ask them. Um, for the ones in the chat, we're going to ask them. And if you want to ask directly, please raise your hand and we'll pass you the word. For the hands-on part, um, you can ask your question anytime, but please raise your hand and we will give you the word just to avoid having a lot of people trying to talk at the same time. Okay, so uh, welcome uh, Davina and thanks for, for giving this workshop today. Davina did her undergraduate studies in biology at the University of Aveiro in Portugal, where she also did her master's, but in scientific illustration more specifically in ornithological illustration. As a freelance illustrator, Davina specializes in scientific illustration, concept art, and children's illustrations, and has a lot of experience in education as well. She has been teaching in the scientific illustration post-graduation program at the University of Aveiro for a while, and she has also been leading several workshops in this topic. So if you want Davina to lead one of your workshops, get in touch with her. <laughs> and besides her work as a freelancer, you can also see her illustrations in a field guide she co-authored called Ia das Aves das Dunas São Jacinto. Yes, it's in Portuguese. This is all uh, quite impressive, Davina. And everybody enjoy, please. And let's, let's start. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, also, thank you uh, for the invitation and organization of this event. Uh, I am actually very honored that you uh, invited me. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, unfortunately, this would be really great to do in present. Uh, uh, with everyone present, it would be way better. But unfortunately, due to COVID, we have to do workshops online, so I will have to focus more on a different technique that it's actually feasible doing via sharing my screen. So basically today you will learn a few techniques on how to draw certain animals. Um, so it will be more about field sketching and not as much hands-on the more refined techniques of scientific illustration. However, I will um, talk in a, a broad uh, way about scientific illustration. Basically, what is it? Um, scientific illustration is a visu visual approach to a scientific concept uh, in a precise, clear and objective way. Meaning, there is, it's a type of art, but there is very little room for creativity. So fantasy does not work in this area, obviously, um, and you are uh, constrained within the rules of science. So you really have to depict an animal, a plant, whatever you, you are, have to draw, in a way that it conveys facts and scientific information. So it is in a way a, a lot of responsibility to do this type of work. Um, just in case people are thinking, okay, but why do we still need scientific illustration? We have uh, photographs. Um, photographs 
uh, do not uh, are not easy as most people think um, because let's say for example if you need to represent an extinct animal or an animal that uh, or a few plants that only live within the deepest forests uh, rainforests in the Amazon and you cannot send a random photographer to go there and take a photograph of the plant and not be extra extraordinarily expensive while a scientific illustrator might be able to do that using collective species um, and, and other types of, of uh, material that it can be based on. So, when did it start? It's quite debatable when the scientific illustration started, but some people say it, it is as old, as ancient as humans could actually start to draw, but um, without a doubt it, it got a lot of more uh, relevance when new territories, new continents were being explored. Um, as you know, at the time, there were no photographers, uh, no cameras, so only artists would be able to write down, note down everything about the new species of uh, plants and animals that were being found in all of these new territories around the world. Of course, the techniques back then weren't that refined. Uh, for example, this is a very popular image of a rhinoceros done by Albrecht Dürer. As you can see, it is not extremely well depicted, but it was the first image that was very um, uh, widespread around the world, uh, published around the world, and it was one of the first images to represent uh, and, communi and communicate the 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 or the concept of what it was a rhinoceros okay so scientifically it's missing a lot of details and has way other things that are not correct but we could kind of accept that this was a beginning for uh, the, the the importance of scientific illustration and communication so here are a few more images, way better images than the, the rhinoceros. Um, these uh, images were probably done in the uh, late 18s. Um, most of this technique is wood, uh, wood cut printing. So basically the image was drawn in a, a piece of wood, the artist would cut it and then would paint, uh, put some paint and ink on it and then would print on a paper. And that's how many of these illustrations were done. Uh, as the years progressed and we can fast forward for more than days, the techniques started to get way more refined, uh, way more detailed also, um, a lot of technology might have helped us to observe creatures more in detail, like microscopes, uh, binoculars, um, etc. And so the, the illustrations also started to develop and refine way more. For example, this is a, an illustration of a, a beetle. Um, and it is done with ink. As you can see, it has a small scale here so that you can uh, understand the size of this animal. Um, then we have here illustration of uh, mushrooms, different species of mushrooms. This was also done with ink. Then there is also other type of techniques. There are many techniques possible. You can do using only ink, you can do using uh, gra graphite, uh, colored pencils, digitally, loads of different possibilities, as long as it is practical. Um, for example, if you are commissioned 
by a scientific um, publisher that only publishes images in black and white, you should not waste your time uh, doing a colored image. So you should work more in black and white uh, media. Uh, so for example, these are several examples for colored techniques. Um, this one, this image over here, top right, was done using markers. This one, bottom right, was colored pencils and markers. And the one in the left is a digital image. But scientific illustration is not only about animals and uh, plants. It, there is all, it is very useful. And probably this one, it's one of the most important areas. Uh, it's very useful for med uh, medical um, uh, areas like anatomic classes. Um, for example, if new te techniques are developed uh, within the, the medicine uh, universe, basic, basically new illustrations are needed to describe each technique uh, all of these images are done digitally. Um, and you have here several examples. As you can see, a photograph would never be able, you could never be able to pull this off with a photograph because it would be messy. It would be very hard to, to actually have a clean vision of what it was actually happening. So in order for a student to understand or any other professional understand exactly what was going on, with a photograph would be way harder than with an illustration. Okay, so um, this, is basic, uh, this is a very basic introduction to scientific illustration. So is there any questions you have before I start the other chapter of this uh, theoretical part? If anyone has any question, please let me know. Um. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not listening. You're, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I have a question, it's more curiosity. Which one is your favorite uh, media to draw? Mm, I, I love traditional media, so any especially colored pencils and um, and uh, markers. Um, it's a it's my favorite one. Uh, however, the digital is usually more popular, not because it's exactly cheaper, but because it's less time consuming. Uh, most of these works have very tight schedules, so artists really need to work uh, faster and digital techniques are way faster than traditional ones. But with the traditional, if you convert it to digital, you have to take a photo? How do you... Oh, you can just scan. You use, it, you use it a, a scanner to uh, put it on as a, a, in a digital file. Um, but basically it is that, but the, the main advantage of doing it digitally is really how fast you can go because you can clone things digitally. Um, you can also control Z your way out of a mistake. Um, so you can undo a mistake you did while Traditionally, you really, really need to be more careful not to make mistakes. So, yeah. However, digitally, it usually has a more plastic look to it. That's my opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? So everyone is in the same page. Shall I move on? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Moving on. <laughs> okay then. So now what would be the main 
thing you need to draw scientific illustration besides the material very basic thing ability to draw uh, skill yeah skill skill is very uh, uh, the skill is very important you really need to draw know how to draw mm -hmm. and people would ask okay so how do you actually do that um is it a god giving thing that happens no probably it's more interest and the will to actually spend many hours practicing however there are a few techniques to help you uh, draw so what would you think and you could write on the chat i will look at it you can leave on the 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 chat um the answer oops sorry we don't want this to happen sorry um so i really want you to leave a, a comment on the chat of what would be the basic skill required to make an illustration or a drawing please give me the answer on the on the chat so i can see what in what page are we sara uh, they can write on the chat right i think so um, but if you if you can uh, make a sign of some kind say something but i think everybody's allowed to write on the on the chat um, but why can't i find the chat i only see q and a here it is the chat okay the <laughs> <laughs> model Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Or is this everyone? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, for, for people who are, who are saying the model, uh, a rapid sketch, etc., look at the question. I'm asking for the basic skill. A model is not a skill, if you know what I mean. So I'm asking for the basic skill. Uh, okay, how to hold the pencil. Well, that's important, yes. But there is a very Im other important, extremely important skill that allows that allows you all to be able to draw. Even if you draw a terrible line, as long as it, as long as it stays within certain rules you will be able to make it work so here's the thing observational skills some people actually replied observation skills focus is important uh hand eye cardio sorry the siren um, Hand-eye coordination is also very important. Practice on details and characteristics are very important. Uh, patience and perseverance, without a doubt. However, if you lack the, uh, the ability to observe what you are actually uh, wanting to draw, none of the other skills will, will help you. So, what do I mean? What does this have to do with anything? Well, I'll show you. Um, so you can see here an image of a, a fly. And I asked a friend of mine to draw this fly. He doesn't draw. 
He did this lovely thing. And here's the thing. No matter, no matter how horrible your drawing skills are, no matter how terrible your uh, lines uh, are, you all know that an insect only has three pairs of legs. It doesn't matter how terrible your lines are or how hard it is for you to actually hold a pencil. That doesn't mean that you will have to draw four, uh, four pairs of le legs in this insect. So this person basically did not care to look at the insect, at the photo, and ask themselves, how many legs does this animal have? They just threw it something like, oh, they have many legs, yay. What else do you find? You can write on the, the chat, what else do you find that it's wrong with this sketch? Besides everything. Okay, but we don't see. Well, you kind of do. I, I don't know how the quality it actually is in your um, computer, but you can actually see one leg here, one over there, and one over there. So you can see three legs on the side. So you can assume that three legs are on this side. Oops. So you, you can see. Uh, but even if you didn't see, you don't see the eight legs, so you don't draw them. Okay, wing um, Number of lines, yes, the, they are quite wrong. Uh, type of wings, yes. The separation between thorax and abdomen, definitely. I mean, this, this animal has one head and when abdomen, uh, the thorax doesn't exist. The wing position, definitely, because someone said the type of wings, I will assume the shape of the wings, the, they drew just some weird shape to the wings, and also the position. They made it um, completely outwards, while the wings are a little bit more downwards, definitely. The number of body segments, yes, it, Wing position, proportions, definitely. The two-part body type, eye disposition, definitely. Length of the antennas, yes, very, very well. Uh, the antennas of this, um, of this animal are way shorter. Uh, so, yeah, basically you all said it. Uh, exactly right. But again, you don't need to have a blessing from the gods to be able to draw this right. Only you need to do is to actually look and observe. So you can say, no, these wings are not right. You really need to have the capacity to understand what you're looking at. Of course, this will take some time. Of course, this will mean that maybe studying a bit of a bit of anatomy will help you out. Of course, all that helps. But when you take your time to observe the, the subject that you want to draw, questions will pop into your head, for example. How many legs does this animal have? So it's an insect. If it's an insect, then it has to have three pairs of legs. Um, how many body parts does it have? So all of these questions will actually make you understand what you need to draw. And when you need to draw it, you will be taking into consideration all of those details. Of, even if you don't draw the proportions exactly right, you will do it way better than what 
this friend of mine did with this animal. Okay? So, need attention to the smallest details. It is necessary to have the knowledge of what you are going to draw. Yes, indeed. In a way, you need to, but, okay, uh, let's say as a scientific illustrator, you will be commissioned to draw uh, human anatomy, uh, micro, microorganisms. Maybe you will have to draw a planet or two. This doesn't mean that you actually need to know extensively about the subject. Of course, you can't know everything. This is why uh, scientific illustrators usually team up with uh, researchers and other specialists from the area. But what you usually do is look for the basics. There are rules within certain parts of science. Look for those basics. Uh, if you have questions, try to figure it out yourself, uh, the answers for, uh, by yourself. If, the, if you can't find the answers and more doubt comes into your mind, talk to a specialist, okay? For example, this animal right here, this insect is a fly, it's not a bee. Go and look into the, the, the reason why this is a fly and why it's not a bee. Um, or a wasp, but if it gets too confusing, figure it out someone who actually knows about the subject and talk to them. Usually when you are commissioned, usually the person who commissions you uh, knows, about the, um, uh, knows about the subject, so he will be the one to actually give you all the information you'll need, okay? But until then, certain things are not 100% dependent on knowing the subject, but actually observing uh, the subject, okay? No matter how many books you read, you get the information that insects have six legs and not eight, okay? So, I'm going to ask you all to stare at this. Oh, by the way, questions? Is there any question? No? No? Okay. So, I'm going to ask you to stare at this image. Does anyone know what this animal is? Oh, a question. Okay, yeah. Uh, if you... Yes? Okay. If you wish, you can unmute and ask directly, if you wish. Oh, okay, the best te technique to use. So you mean, um, <clears throat> yeah, it depends on what your client wants and what you want, actually. Let's say that you are, let's say you are commissioned by the client, okay? He will have to let you know where, for what does he need the drawing for? Is it going to go into a book that will be printed in color or is it going to be printed black and white? Obviously, if it's going to be printed black and white, there is no need for you to do it um, in color. So you will need to know those details. Now, let's say you are doing this just for your personal pr pleasure and um, actually you just want to make a, an image for a portfolio. Indeed, some techniques work better in different types of uh, uh, subjects that you are going to draw. For example, if you are going to paint mammals, it's not a good idea to use Markers, for example, colored markers um, or ink. Mammals are a, a very, a, a very good. Uh, so fur is is better to be drawn using pencils. 
um, if you're going to paint uh, an extremely textureless animal, say, a, I don't know, a snake, it has the scales, but the scales are very, very, very uh, bright and shiny. So there is almost no texture to the scale. Um, so if you're going to draw those, you better not use uh, an extremely rough textured paper for that drawing. You should get a more um, how do you call it? A, 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 a type of paper that almost has no texture to it. So the painting comes as smooth as possible. If you use an extremely textured paper, paper it will always have that grainy and rough texture to the colors. Okay, so you really need to take into consideration and know the materials and know how materials actually behave uh, and interact with each other in order to, to draw it. For this insect, I would use colored pencils and markers because this insect in particular does not have much texture. And I would use in a, uh, a, a more smooth paper because the insect does not have much texture it only has a little bit of uh, fur over there but not much to worry about okay did i yeah any any other questions about materials about observation skills no Okay, so I'm going to ask you all to stare at this image. Um, what do you see besides a bird? And uh, let's pretend that this image doesn't have any color. What do you see? You can write on the, ch uh, the chat. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, um, I, I don't. I don't mean. I don't mean. What do, do you see in terms of species? Sorry, I didn't specify. I mean, as in, does it have a short neck, a long neck, uh, proportions, all of that? Sorry, uh, it's that that I'm asking. Okay, long big, stretched legs, indeed, large wings, yes. So this animal definitely is not a sparrow. So we can agree on that. Why is it that it's not a sparrow? Or a pigeon, a flying bird, very well. Okay, different morphology. Morphology, yes. Too, uh, the neck is too long. Uh, yes, too long and big. Indeed, the sparrow is a more short, stubby and stocky bird. So this is a, this is a very primary and basic observational skill that you are using. You are comparing this uh, black stork to a perhaps more familiar uh, bird, the sparrow that we can actually see almost every day within the city. And obviously this is not a sparrow. And you are using your observational skills in order to determine that this animal is definitely not a sparrow. Therefore, if it's not a sparrow, you will should never draw it as if it is a sparrow, okay? So you would always need to draw with a long beak, a small head, a 
long neck, long legs, etc. It doesn't fit to, into the passerine pesser, pesser, look. Yeah, de definitely. Uh, it doesn't work that way. So, but now we have this one. How would you describe this one? <laughs> Flying bird. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay, as the same picture, exactly. This bird has also a long beak, big wings, long neck, rather stretched legs. However, there is a very important detail on it that if you see these two birds in flight, you can actually tell one from another. Long curvy neck, exactly. That's true. The neck is collected, exactly. Oh, the color, um, Agatha, uh, I mentioned in the beginning of this uh, challenge, I mentioned not to, to ignore the, cl the color for now. <clears throat> but if you saw these two birds in flight, you would be able to tell me Oh, this one definitely is not um, Ardia. I totally forgot how you say it in English. Damn it, how do you say it in English? I'm stuck with the stork now. What's the name in English of this bird? I can't believe I forgot it. Heron, thank you, Heron, yes. <laughs> So you have the stork and you have the heron. If you, um, if you saw these two in flight, you would be able to tell that this one definitely was not the heron because herons, when they fly, they curve their neck backwards, okay? There is, in detail, there is Differences, obviously, on the, 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 the shape of the eyes, the beak, um, everything. But the main one, the striking one, is the flight pose. And again, it's the observational skills that are at work here. You are comparing both and you are figuring out the differences. And this is extremely important. Now, let's say you want to draw them. Uh, let's say you want to draw the stork, for example. Most people, when they start to draw, when they don't know how to do it, um, most people, when they start to draw, they start to draw the, from the eye, then they draw the bill, and then they draw the neck. But then they are actually not observing again the things they are just working all the details throughout the drawing but if you were in the field doing this trying to draw an animal by observation the animal would be long gone before you could actually have one detail finished so what we usually do is we don't approach into detail right away we do it the general shape and then we understand with that general shape the proportions and then we start to work the details okay for example if i had to draw this stork one of the things that i can actually understand here is that the animal is basically in a horizontal position it has a slight curve to it, but in a general way, it's in a horizontal position. So there would be no point in actually drawing it in any other position besides horizontal. So I could start it with just one simple line, saying this is the position of this animal. And then I could cut the line in three parts, one part for the neck, one part for the wings, one part for the legs figuring out the proportion of each part. For example, 
if you actually look at this image, what would you say are the proportions for the leg, wing, and neck? You can write on the chat. Yeah, basically. Mm. 40, 40, 20. Okay, you are actually working, working it out. Let's, so when you are not super familiar with the things, this is a good way, you try to figure it out. You would say, is it one third? And then you would draw on your image, on your paper, and you, by looking at your own drawing, you would see, no, maybe it's a bit more for the neck, uh, or maybe it's one third for each part except the beak, because if uh, perhaps the beak is making it the head and neck way bigger than it actually is. So uh, we can chop the beak off and just figure it out the other parts of the body and then add the beak later. So we would have to play with all of these possibilities. And then one important detail is, for example, the head uh, is more or less aligned with the eye, uh, sorry, with the tail, the tip of the tail and the eye are more or less aligned with a horizontal line. Okay, and then the tip of the feet and the tip of the beak are also aligned. So this would be a way for you to understand how the bird positions itself to fly. So if you would draw, you would have to draw it within those rules. No matter how bad your lines would look, no matter how sketchy and messy your drawing would look if the eyes of your stork is aligned with the tip of the tail and the tip of the beak are aligned with the tip of its toes then you would have a constrained drawing which means when you learn these rules of observation there is less room for mistake so the better your drawing will actually look. Let's say, for example, whenever we draw stick figures, no matter how silly they are, the usual stick figure, one ball, and then a stick, two legs, and two other lines for the arms, there is a very basic thing that you could actually, that no one actually draws right. When you draw a stick figure, oddly enough, the trunk of the, hu of the human in that stick figure is way large and the legs are super short. Humans do have kind of long legs. So when you draw the stick figure, it, you should actually shorten a bit more the, the part that refers to the trunk and then you should uh, you should draw larger and more uh, larger legs. Okay, so by understanding, by observing things, you can actually leave less room for mistake. Okay. So now, any any questions? Throw questions, please do. Throw some questions at me. Because now we are going to draw. Um, it really depends on some insects. Is it uh, um, in the drawings of some insects? I actually do as if the light was coming right from the top. Um, others, uh, light, 
you you should you should imagine that uh, il the illustration is actually a way of doing when you're when you're drawing whatever a tree an animal a micro whatever the light should be as if you're in those studios all white with the mo with the, the the most light possible around you so it is and so it eliminates the shadows as much as possible. If you only have one light source, uh, it actually kind of ruins the drawing a bit, unless you're looking for a more dramatic um, strategy there. Um, yes, Beatrice, because... Um, If you so in the it's still on the part of the light. If you're actually drawing something of a dramatic scene, let's say a hunting, um, <clears throat> sorry, let's say you're drawing a, no, not a hunting uh, situation, but a uh, a habitat. So you're drawing a habitat with all the animals in it. Yes, in that case, light source is rather important. Uh, not exaggerating uh, the, the, the contrast, uh, but it's rather important to give a little bit more of a volume and three-dimensional look. However, if you're drawing uh, an animal, uh, just one, just for the sake of it, it should be drawn as if it, you are in a photographic studio with everything white around you, the best light possible to eliminate as much shadows as possible. Um, then, how can you work out the first lines of the drawing depending on the animal? Yes, the, so this is one thing that comes with a practice a bit. Um, it really it really depends. So I'm going to give, and I'm going to talk about animals in this case. I'm not going to mention plants. Plants actually, uh, there is a good advantage to them. They don't run around and they don't move much. So, yeah, we are happy with that. Um, but uh, animals. So you should see what the animal actually, the, the main structure of the animal is. For example, if you're drawing an insect, a crustacean, for example, a crab um, or a lobster or a beetle, mosquito, whatever, these animals don't have much movement. Uh, they, they barely change the shape of their bodies, barely. Um, most of them, uh, they practically only move their legs. So they are very strict shapes. For example, if you want to draw a, a beetle uh, from stand, uh, as if you were standing up on him, staring at him from the top, you basically can start with a very basic rectangular shape and figure it out the proportions after that. So you draw a rectangular shape and say, this part of the rectangular is for the head, this part for the thorax, this other part for the abdomen, and then you work the details from there. Um, but if you're drawing, for example, a dog, like my lovely doggy over there, you really need to be a little bit more careful. For example, my dog is all squashed in the, the sofa, as a queen, as she is. And because she's sleeping, she has a completely different for, uh, shape to her. If she was, for example, standing and running around uh, after her friends. So usually what you do with a, a mammal, you try to draw the skeleton and understand the skeleton of, of the animal, okay? So you need to 
again, you don't need to know every single bone that the animal has on its skeleton, but you need to understand there is the head, there is the neck, the neck moves a lot, and you draw the basic lines for the skeleton and then you flesh out the animal. I can demonstrate uh, right this right, uh, right now if you want, uh, but I just want to know if there are other questions before I demonstrate that. I, I will, I will. I just want to know if, is there any other question more that I can answer more um, verbally? <laughs> Uh, I have a question, another one. Yeah. Uh, how do you cope with color matching in the sense of, because I know color plays a very important role in distinguishing a um, scientific illustration from just a nature drawing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes photos uh, do not correspond exactly to what yes. we see in nature. So how yes. do you color match if you haven't seen the animal? Mm. That's, a very, that's a very, very good question. Um, so I'm going to um, obviously remove animals that are extinct because we will never know. Yeah. Um, for example, dinosaurs, they are every, that's where creativity actually kind of works a bit. Um, now, let's say for example, someone this will have to be a very teamwork with the specialists. Let's say someone wants you to draw, <clears throat> sorry, a bird that only lives in uh, the rainforests in Central, uh, in Central America. And there are only two individuals uh, in the collection, uh, in the museum that are uh, preserved and no one has ever taken a photo of it and there is nothing in captivity to for you to figure it out you will have to work with those animals and with a specialist let's imagine that actually the specialist has seen it he will be the, your guy your guide in that situation um it and there will be a bit of speculation in that situation as well, because there is not much material. Now, you never seen the animal, but they are photographs, just like you said. Yes, photographs are a problem. The, my advice is go to the internet and find as many as possible. For example, okay. birds, birds do have this one problem, is they are more visible and easier to photograph during mornings or um, uh, sun, uh, at uh, sunset. And the light tends to be a bit more orange, yellowish on those situations and the colors also get a bit more orange and yellow. So basically, you will really need to find as many images as possible. You can also look for the possibility that there are animals in captivity. Um, you will have your specialist friend working with you. Um, if you see many videos on YouTube, as much material as possible, you will start to see the type of color that it has the, the more naturally as possible. If you see just one photograph, that will be the only information your brain will take. But if you have way many possibilities around you, you will start to figure it out. Oh, this one was taken probably in the morning light, so it's not very uh, well, this is not the best one for me to match the colors. Uh, you can also start to understand when the photographer actually uh, exaggerated the contrasts in Photoshop. Uh, you will start to see that the colors that don't look that natural. Um, so yeah, you will have to look for as much photographs as possible and then start to test uh, that on sketches and see which one your client will actually like more. 
this is why a drawing like this actually takes sometimes a month to do because we want our client happy but he will have to do a lot of work as well and giving us feedback saying oh i like this one this is exactly what i want or maybe he will say no this this bird for example you did too yellow or orange for what it really is and you will have to adjust the the colors a little bit by eye and uh, trial and error um, however with practice it starts to get easy way easier you start to see that the photographs are not the best ones the colors are way too saturated it, they will, it will start to come easy and natural to you yeah okay thank you anything else no okay so i will go into demonstrate a bit what i was what I meant with the other question. Just give me a moment, I'm changing to Photoshop. So, share screen. Um, who I lost the chat again. Where did the chat go? Sorry, let me just get chat. Yeah. So it's Patricia. Patricia, let's say you need to draw a cat and you are staring at your cat. You want to practice a bit about... So the basically basic shape of a, a mammal it's, it's this, you have the head, you have the neck, you have chest and thorax, legs, So this is a very basic shape. From here, once you understand this, it's way easier for you to do any other pose that these animals might do. And I'm going to show you how. So, let me just get this out of here. Let's say you want to draw a cat cleaning its feet. What happens to a cat when it is cleaning his, his feet? His back paws, not the ones on the front, the ones in the back. It's folded on itself. Mm -hmm. It's folded on itself. But there is one thing that is a rule. His nose is on the feet, meaning head and feet are together. So if this is happening, the nose is here. I mean, if the nose is here, the eyes have to be here. And then means the ears need to be here as well. And his feet is over here. Now, if his head is here and the feet is here, all of the rest of the body has to be within this area. It doesn't make sense to make the rest of the body on any other part of the, uh, of the paper sheet. 
So if his, his foot is here, his foot C is here, means that his heel is here as well, and his knee has to be here. And then his hip has to go on this direction. If his hip, whoops, sorry. If his hip is here, means that the backbone, his spine has to also be somewhere around here. Now, if his head is here, the spine needs to go from the head down to his hip and then the tail will be here or curved like this it doesn't matter because the the spine needs to go from this point from the head down here to the hip the rest of his body is in this area so the hip you can add some flesh here the hip has its flesh and then you have his foot here that means that the belly and all the gut is on this area now it depends how fat the cat is if it is something like my dad's cat then the fat will be something like this bonk. and then his legs front legs are like this so that he can have some balance because if you drew his legs on different directions the cat wouldn't have balance and he would fall off so for him to hold this position he needs to have his front legs doing this and then the other leg is somewhere on the background or behind all this belly fat and you have a cat washing his footsie. Now let's say you want to draw a dog running. Well, he, running, no, I'm not going to say running because running you actually need to look a bit more how the running works, how they put their paws and their legs, how does it work. However, uh, let's say you want to draw a dog uh, sitting. Let me just remove the cat. Sorry. For example, so you want to draw a dog sitting. You have the head of the dog. If he is sitting, what happens to the rest of the body? So you, you, you have a dog that is not sitting. This dog is not sit, sitting right now. This dog is just standing. But if he sits, what, what, what is it essential to happen? Just write on the chat. Okay, legs are folded. Yes, the legs are folded. But, but what needs, but for, when the legs fold, what happens? Back legs are folded, yes, yes. the body weight shifts to the back yes the body weight shifts to the back so basically this part this part moves forward the dog and for this to move forward the dog needs to drop his butt down meaning the spine goes down as well the neck and the head basically stay the same. They change a bit, but not that much. The thorax and chest stays much the same, but the back goes down. And the legs fold like this. Oops, I did this one wrong. And you have a sitting dog. And then you can flesh out the dog.
Okay? Now, what shall we do today? Um, I want you to draw something now. So please pick up your paper, pens, pencils, um, not erasers. Don't use erasers, the least possible. And uh, I think you, you, I think you have a photo reference of a wolf, right? You did download that image? Yes. Yep. Okay, so get the, the wolf on the screen. And I'm going to teach you how to draw that wolf. Whenever you're ready, let me know. Ready. Ready? Okay. So, what I want you guys to do is a square. Again, this is not a technique that is equal for every single artist Everyone has their own techniques. But I want you to draw for this, I want you to draw a square or something close to a square. Don't no need to use the ruler. You don't need to use this. <laughs> Just draw a random square. Oh, thank you, Tao. Hernandez, thank you. So I want everyone, to draw like you. Sorry to interrupt uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. You can learn. You can learn. Oh, look at my dog. Look at what she's. <laughs> um. So, uh, has everyone drawn the marvelous square? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now you are going to, oh, uh, in, this, in this part you can interrupt me to ask a question because uh, in this situation some, uh, some doubts or, or some questions may arise, uh, so feel free to let me know if you need me to repeat something. So now you have your super square drawn, drawn. now you're going to divide your square in four little squares, again, as close as possible to a square, no need to be. So, is everyone on the same page? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, uh, here in this situation, you can unmute yourself if you want. Otherwise, you will be a little bit take, taking too much time writing. So you can unmute and, and talk. Now, you will make a very light line dividing these squares in two. Okay? What I just did here, what I'm doing is marking the points where each uh, essential part of the wolf's face will be. So what do I mean by this? So, here and here, immediately down the line, they will be the eyes. So if you wish, you can draw a, a ball, a round circle, more or less.
And this will be the eyes of the wolf. Then, because you, you, you are using this, um, because you are using uh, this technique, uh, it actually makes you do the proportions right. Of course, this only works if the wolf is staring at you right in front, looking right front to you. Um, in a different position would be a different technique. But again, we are starting from the beginner. Beginning, sorry. Now, down here, you will draw a somewhat, imagine like as if it was a triangle, but with round, with round points, okay? So you will do, draw more or less a triangle, but with round points here, and it will be a nose for your wolf. Okay? Notice this one detail. Notice that the nose is not as wide as the distance between these two lines. So don't draw it too wide, but also don't draw it too short. Okay? Notice this detail here. Then, Another thing you're going to do now is on this side, you cut off the tip of the square. You can round it up a bit. Even I am not doing it perfectly well. Okay, everyone in the same page? Yes. Yep, yeah. okay. So, next, you can draw a triangular shape, more or less, here. Again, a bit more on the round side, don't make a an exact triangular but this will represent the ears and then down here you draw a small line that goes, that starts right in the middle of the nose, then the mouth. It's almost a straight line, but not quite. It has a slightly, slightly curve upwards. It curves slightly upwards, but very, but it's very soft, okay? And then, only to go immediately up. Okay? Then, you draw the chin, it's basically a curve. Then you draw the nostrils. Make those nostrils aligned. Don't draw one up and another one down, and then you just put a line like this. And then, if we wish, we can detail the eyes a little bit more. All you have to do is just make this 
effect here that the wolves have. So, how are your wolves going? Before we continue, how are they going? It actually looks like a wolf. <laughs> ah, not bad, not bad. You can you can show show the image. Mm hmm. Yeah, very well. <laughs> Sara Pedro, are you giving a shot? I must say I'm not. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Anyone else wants to show show off their lovely artwork? Uh, I can't see every single camera. Oh, hello. <laughs> oh, looking nice, looking nice. Very well. <laughs> I don't know if there are, oh, there are more people showing off. Sorry, this, this doesn't show all the cameras. Very good. Uh, let me see, how can I know what's your name? Oh, this is hard zoom. How can we see people's names? It's supposed to show uh, under the video. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure it out. I'm seeing someone who's showing me the drawing right in front of me and I don't know who it is. I just wanted to say that it's looking fine. And then someone else showed me on the computer and it's looking fine. And maybe, the girl with the, the drawing on the computer, I think your name is Irina. Um, the ears are a little bit small. That's the only thing I have to say. Then there's someone else with some nice finger, fingernails, red fingernails, and I'm seeing your drawing. Uh, you're looking nice as well. Uh, then there is someone else that I really don't have no idea. Oh. Damn it, how can I know who you are? The fingers was Marta Oliveira with the fingernails, <laughs> the red fingernails. Red, red fingernails, <laughs> it was who? Marta Oliveira. Ah, uh, Marta Oliveira, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, basically everyone who already showed me, everyone is looking just fine. The only thing I have to say is the girl that is showing on the computer, you have the ears of the wolf a little bit too small. That would be the only critic I have Thank to say. Thank you. <laughs> now, what you will do is you look at your wolf and you will look at the wolf on the photograph. This will be the observation, observational exercise. Um, Practically everyone, in terms of positions of the, the, the elements of the wolf, you, everyone did it right. So the eyes on, are on the right side, the nose is in the right side. Um, however, in terms of proportions, things might be a little bit different. And I want you to look at your wolf and see if the nose is a bit too short or if the ears are a bit too short um, or a bit too big, just critique yourself. That's an observational skill. Uh, to level up your observational skill, you need to do that. For example, if I look at my wolf, one of the things I notice is indeed I have to do one thing. Looking at my wolf, I need to cut this more. Actually, I'm going to do it in red. I need to cut this more to give room for more ears. My wolf ears are short. They are bigger.
see if your wolfy woofy ears are looking okay. <clears throat> and one thing I also noticed about my wolf, I did the eyes a little bit too big. So I'm going to make them a little bit smaller. And the nose is a little bit more rounded. Feeling comfy? So, how is it going? What are you changing in your? How, uh, what, uh, oh, someone said I draw the pig. Who drew a pig? Agatha. <laughs> Let me see the pig. <laughs> Why? I don't see it. the pig. I think the eyes, oh, let me see. Could you just uh, zoom in a bit? I, I think your square is a little bit rectangular, maybe. I think your square is a bit re rectangular, so the wolf has a more a longer snout. Now, let's detail a bit our wolf, shall we? So how to detail our wolf? Ooh. Easy. Easy. As you notice, the wolf has a very, probably that photo was taken during the winter or something. It has quite a puffy fur coat around him, okay? So that area is way out of the, um, the square. So now we, we are going to unknown territory and we are going to draw outside the square. First things first, the wolf, for a start, if you draw fur, don't do it like this, okay? Don't do it this way. This is the classical way. Um, I'm going just to temporarily take my wolf out. When people draw fur, if they do it like this, it will look like the animal actually, I don't know, got a, an electrical shock. I can actually show you that. Oh, Crash Bandicoot, yeah, it kind of works. So, don't draw it like this, okay? Fur is soft. Fur is not a very well-defined line when you're looking in a more distant, uh, point of view. 
So if you're, you want to, to draw fur, let's say, for example, you have a charming wolf here. with a lovely coat and you want to draw the fur, you do it something more like this. Soft, undefined lines. You sometimes can make this, but do not exaggerate and do everything. You just some lines are just that, lines, then others you can actually make a V and see how it looks way softer. If you're drawing actually a, oh, it's called that animal. It's not the porcupine, it's the other one, hedgehog. If you're actually drawing a hedgehog, that makes sense making a more well-defined lines because it has spines, spikes, I mean. But fur needs to be soft, okay? So, we have, where's the wolf? Here. So we have our wolf with its extraordinarily soft fur. Now, you'll have to figure it out one thing first. The fur is going outward in the beginning and then it starts to go again inward. Okay? So, I'm actually going to do a zoom in here. Sharpen up those pencils and start drawing fur. Pay attention to the direction of the fur in your wolf photo. You will notice that it has fur going upward, fur going downward. Actually, where is the photo? I do have the photo here with me, I think. Don't I? Yes, I do. Just notice this one detail. Notice that the fur is going here, right on the side, is going on this direction. So the lines that you are going to draw are going on that direction. However, here, the fur is going on this direction. It's going downward. So the fur you're going to draw is going downward and here it's going more downward. So you will have to respect those lines on the wolf fur in order to make sense. Upward here, upward, straight, going downward, downward, downward. How is the fur going? I like it. It's looking nice. Mm. More. Looks nice to me. Remember, it has to be outside the square. 
not in the square. Now, more details. For example, if you notice, your wolf does have markings around its eyes, so you can actually do a few marking lines, but very gently and lightly around, like this, around its eyes. Another detail you can find on the wolf are the whiskers and where the whiskers insert you can do if you notice they are lines it's not so you don't you don't have the snout of the wolf and you have random spots where the whiskers are no you have the snout of the wolf and they are lines, actually. And the whiskers just come out of each one of these spots. Then they have quite fluffy ears. So you can also add some fur in here. So, how's it going? I think I didn't like the fur. Oh, looking nice. I have to take my... And can you zoom in a bit more? I can't see it very well. Oh, it's a little bit too puffy, maybe. You, you made it puffy like this, and then it went down. You need to make it puffy like this, more round shape around his head, you know? <laughs> it's not fluffy enough. <laughs> <laughs> lovely wolf over there. Everyone has lovely wolves. Mm. When, there was one, I think it was called Jose. I didn't see because the background yeah, didn't I let see. me see the... <laughs> ah, okay. Just a small one. Yeah. I can see. The ears are a tad small. Yes. <laughs> Just that. <laughs> oh, lovely wolfies we have here. So many lovely wolves. Uh -huh. Daniel Ricardo, your looked very yours looked very nice. Uh, man, I would I don't know why it doesn't give me your name. Everyone who has the camera on, the name disappears and I don't know who you are. Oh well, uh, everyone who is showing me right now, I like it. Uh, more. So, now let's do one thing. You all use pencils, right? Do you have pens? Yeah, yeah, we all have pen. Good. Then now let's refine the lines. Let's make it look pretty. So to refine the lines, this is what you need to do. Get a pen. If it is blue, no problem. If it is black, it's best. 
but you are now going to draw above your sketch and let's make the drawing look sharp and nice. Obviously, you're not going to draw above the, um, uh, you're not going to draw the square, you're only going to draw the wolf. So don't draw the square, nor the lines you use to figure it out which, uh, where were the eyes positioned and whatnot. So you're going to draw only the wolf and what belongs to the wolf. So, first things first. When we are doing a more refined line to our drawings, there is an important thing you need to remember. The thickness of the line actually counts a lot in giving shape and volume to your drawing. Even if you don't work on um, the shadows, the lines are really good to give a more uh, how do you say, a more three-dimensional look to your drawing. What do I mean? I'm going to remove the wolf. Let's say, no. let's say you have a dumb triangle here, okay? It looks pretty dumb, annoyingly simple and flat. Now let's imagine that it has light coming from this direction. A very basic way of giving some shape to this triangle is actually thickening the line on the side that they will be, on the side where will be some shading. And this makes the triangle way more interesting. Okay, I don't know if you can see that, but I can give an example with a more organic shape. Let's say we have Let's say we have a random links. Basic, horrible one. The light is going from, is coming from this direction. If I thicken this line here, if I thicken this one over here, if I thicken this side as well, the drawing gets a little bit more of a three dimensional effect even though it's just a line drawing, a line art. I don't know if you can notice that difference. So what I want you to do with your wolf is, let's pretend light is coming from Let's pretend light is coming from this direction. So what you're going to do is first, you draw the lines on top of your sketch. Don't do them thick, nothing. They, you just draw a line with your, pen, with your pen, okay? So let's, let's do it. Take your time. If you don't finish all, there's not, it's not problem, no problem.
<clears throat> How's it going? The idea, <clears throat> obviously, you have a sketch, but the idea is then to have a more clean version. Now, the idea is to go on and refine your lines. Meaning, for example, I can thicken this line on this side a bit more. And maybe thicken this one as well. I can go here and actually darken this, the nostrils because nostril, nostrils are, are dark. There are little holes. I can make the line thicker on this side here, but not on this one. And thicker on this one side as well. And I can work on this ones as well and make a bit more thicker on this side. If you wish to produce a little bit more of effects, you can do a few lines here. It gives the idea that there is more shadow on the side. But a few simple, as you can see, what the hell went wrong? As you can see, just a few simple lines here. You can put a few simple lines on the side as well. And perhaps right here, like this, it gives the effect that shadow is happening over there.
And by the way, if you wish, you can add the pupil. And my wolf looks a complete retard. So how are those wolves going? Show him. I like. Yep. Liking it so far? I guess it's okay. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm liking that one. Yeah. Enjoying this this a lot. <laughs> yeah, looking fine. I think it's Anika who just showed me her drawing. Oh, hello. Yes, lovely wolf over there. Anika, I would say your wolf has slightly small eyes. That's only I have, the only thing I have to say. And uh, there is someone else that I don't know the name, has the wolf with a bit of a squinty look, but the, the eyes need to be slightly rounder, but not too much. Is this your first attempt at drawing something in a more serious way? Because if it is, I'm liking these wolves a lot. So for me, no, it's not the first time. Okay. <laughs> nice wolf. Nice, nice, nice. Um, the, yep, like, 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 like. I would say this is the first time I'm, I'm drawing something, actually thinking about the details so much and, you know, the, the proportions and, but I have drawn before, but this is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you make yourself, restrict yourself in, into, constrain yourself into a tight grid, of proportions where you say the wolf cannot be more than just this square. The eyes need to be in the middle of the lines around the square and whatnot. By doing that, you leave less and less room for mistake, where the only mistakes that will exist will probably be maybe the shape of the eyes, but at least the eyes are in the right, right spot. Mm -hmm. So these techniques help you now of course we cannot use this technique let's say for a horse uh, the square does not work with a horse it would have to be something else i love those eyes whoever is sharing them now <laughs> have nice eyes very placid and sweet eyes <laughs> So we are coming to, a, to an end. Um, I would like to give a few final thoughts. Um, first of all, I really like the wolves that you drew. They were really nice. Few wolves had smaller ears. You really need now to actually stare at the photograph and this will be at home, where you are, the exercise that for your observational skills. Uh, to improve your observational skills, you will now look at your wolf, look at the photograph, and think about it. Maybe you'll see, okay, maybe the shape I used for the eyes is not the best one. Uh, maybe I made a too long face for the wolf. 
maybe the ears are not the right size. Now you will have to judge yourself. And by judging yourself, you're actually improving your observational skills. Next time when you will draw a wolf, you will be taking into consideration those details. However, you will also take into consideration those details whenever you're drawing a fox, a lynx, a cat, whatever that is more or less similar. It will be harder to use the wolf as a base model for completely different animals. Like I said, a horse is completely different. It's very hard. Using the wolf, you cannot really try to draw an equivalent with the horse. However, with similar animals, now you can figure it out. If you draw a cat, the proportions will be a little bit different and you can try to figure it out what proportions will be different. For example, the, the length of its nose, the cats have a very, very short nose. So if you're going to draw a cat, you'll have to see what type of shape you will use in order to draw the cat. A fox will be different. A fox has a smaller nose, bigger eyes. So if you want to give it a shot with other animals that are more or less similar to the wolf, feel free. It's a great way for you to actually exercise and try, try this technique. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. And you can talk via microphone. No problem. Unmute yourself, it will be quicker. No questions? Well, I guess... I was just going to ask, uh, when you're doing, like, uh, when you go out uh, to watch the animals or something like that, and you have to draw on time, like you have your sketchbook or something and you have to draw on time, it's easier to just do like the sketch overall, like the, the square, the kind of eyes and everything, and then complete it with photos or? Yes, uh, photos without a doubt will always help you. It's stupid to go full Puritan on things, saying I will never use photographs. Mm, don't do that. <laughs> However, photographs don't give the same information as going into uh, the wild and talking about animals only. Uh, photographs will never give you the same information. If you go into the wild and see the animals, you actually will see the personality as well, position, quirks that they might have. And uh, it will make you also familiar, more familiar with the animal, the textures how the feathers or the scales work together. Something that the photograph many times doesn't give you right. But what it, it is hard to draw in the field, but it gets easier with time. My first drawings were horrible, and I can say really, truly horrible. Uh, but as with more and more practice, I started to be able to actually work more and more details. However, photographs will always be very useful. Never, never, never let go of photographs. However, don't rely 100% on them. That is definitely also very wrong. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Yeah, uh, on the same line. If you are drawing in a while and you have like two minutes and you're watching, for instance, a bird, What's the first thing you pick up? Okay, uh, one thing I can tell you, two minutes is quite a luxury. Uh, usually yeah. it's only 20 seconds. The first thing I pick up, basic, basic shape and the way it poses itself, uh, it handles itself around. Uh, because one of the very, in, in the case of birds, one of the very important ways of identifying a bird, it's the way it's positioned. Uh, sometimes the pose, it's enough for, you, for an ornithologist to actually manage to identify the bird. Sometimes they can see the bird from the far, but they, they can't see the colors, but the silhouette is enough for them to identify. So 
I tried to figure it out what is the way the bird actually poses usually the position that it has on the tree branch or the ground and then I'll figure it out the shape usually it's the sil for the birds it's the silhouette without a doubt uh, it's the most important thing you can only see a bird far far away however the silhouette is completely different from bird to bird you can see the difference between a starling and uh, and a, a um, blackbird only by looking at the silhouette so that is the first thing I go to with birds um, but then if I have more time I'll go for the, the basic shape proportions and the bill and then I start to work on the details yeah. okay and what about the how to deal with the cartoonish look because when we're, you're a beginner and you're starting everything looks like a cartoon everything looks like Look, looks like a cartoon not oh, really yeah, live so how to deal with that uh you know in sketching everything looks cartoonish actually because you only have a pencil a paper and you'll have to translate everything in the world that it's three-dimensional into a two-dimensional simple drawing so it will always look a little bit more on the cartoonish side however i think that what makes extremely something extremely cartoonish are the strong well-defined eyes um, with a bit of way too much expression to them. For example, you know, you're, you're, you're drawing, I'm going to remove the wolf again, but let's say you're drawing a, a, a black bird, you know, you know, just something like this. No, this is not the black bird because it has a, too much, okay, this is a, whatever, it doesn't matter, it's a random bird. And then, you draw the eye and you make something like this. The, the, you're cartooning way too much the, the, the animal. So try to avoid drawing extremely detailed eyes. Usually the more detailed eyes you draw, the more cartoonish it will look. Uh, also, in the sketches, when people excessively uh, press the, 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 the pencil on the paper and the lines become too bold, too well defined. That has a very cartoony look to it. Um, usually you go with something way more simpler, something more like this. And not something too well defined. The cartoony look comes from this type of drawing where you exaggerate the contours. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, and just uh, one more thing. What about symmetry? Because we know there, there are symmetry, but if you overdo it, it kind of loses meaning because Hmm. But symmetry in what sense? Because in a bug, mm -hmm. it's exactly, they are extremely symmetrical animals. Unless, yeah, yeah what, what are you going to say? Sorry. Uh, I'm saying in the terms of uh, furred animals. Fur? You know the, yeah, the coat is similar, but they might have some spot on a side or, or another. Oh, okay. No, uh, oh. Symmetry looks a little, if you exaggerate it, okay, it did, it will look weird, unless it is in a extremely symmetrical animal, for example, a dragonfly. Dragonflies are, sorry, I'm just trying to make a new, why isn't this working? I wanted to make a new layer. Uh, 
Well, was I, what I was trying to say, they are extremely symmetrical animals, so yes, you can draw them. However, there are others that are not as much. For example, our wolf today. So, if you looked at the photo, you will notice that uh, you, you have the wolf, right? But instead of making the fur too exaggeratedly symmetrical, let's say, like this, you can make a little bit of chaos around this area. For example, instead of the fur all going together in the same point, which exaggerates the symmetry in the wolf, you can actually make, for example, another line of fur here that will go to the side and a, another line definition of the lines here and a bit more of fur here and then you can for example the wolf might be looking at you but he might be looking at you but with a body to the side so you can hint here on this part a bit of his back so it doesn't look as symmetrical as it should be. It's a technique, a way of doing. Or example, another example, if you have the wolf looking straight at you, but one of the ears are actually listening to something in that direction and the other one is pointing at you. For example, it's a way of not making too symmetrical. I think I think that was what you yeah, were looking exactly for. Exactly what I was looking for. Okay, okay. Thank you. But of course, there are animals that are ridiculously symmetrical. For example, the dragonflies, as I said earlier, uh, the dragonflies are very, very much symmetrical. Uh, so you can't do much about it. But let's say a bug, whatever the bug might be, one of the things you can actually do instead of making the legs exactly the same, you can work out as if it was walking. So one leg is more downward, the other is a little bit more on that direction, and the other one is like this, the other one is in front, but this one is more on the side. For example, this is a way of avoiding extreme uh, symmetry. Yeah, that was exactly Thanks. right. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. Anything else? Um, hello. Yeah. So my, I'm Katya. So hello, my question Katya. is more personal. First, mm -hmm. I would like to thank you for this wonderful work, uh, work and amazing workshop. Oh, so thank my you. question is, thank you. Uh, how do you feel about producing uh, art that doesn't give you room for creativity or imagination? You how do I feel? Yeah. I'm sorry, how do I feel about? I didn't Producing listen. art that doesn't give you uh, ah, okay. space for creativity or imagination. Well, I, I'm going to say I'm quite privileged on that part because I'm not that creative. I followed, I followed biology, uh, so I love to represent reality. And reality isn't that much creative because I like science and the precise way of science being, I like the rules. I'm constantly bickering with artists and artists are constantly bickering with me, uh, always saying, it's hey, you're not an artist, uh, that's not art. Art is interpretation and, and all those things that artists do. So no, I'm not that creative. And I actually like to have, I, I, I feel very happy that exists that this uh that scientific illustration actually exists because it gives me a spot for my work because i'm not creative i love to draw every single detail in the nose of a wolf i love how nature is uh, and i love to represent it now i'm going to speak for some artists that i know and many, there, 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 are, there are two types. 
are they are the ones that are really artists and they really feel constrained about it and sometimes frustrated and actually don't end up following scientific illustration however they came to learn more about the techniques because they might use this the techniques they learn in scientific illustration on their art however there are other types of artists of course i'm not um I'm not talking about abstract artists. I'm talking those who draw art, but not exactly scientific type of art. However, there are the fantasy artists. They, though they don't draw uh, scientific illustration, the fantasy art they draw actually has some kind of realism to it. For example, dragons, um, they, are, they don't exist. But there is some kind of realism to the dragons. So studying the wildlife, understanding how nature works in order to make their dragons as believable as possible, it's quite useful for them. So though they have all the creativity to make the weirdest looking dragons, they wish to hook a bit of their creativity to reality in order to make their dragons and their creature fantasy actually uh, believable. Um, no matter how much scary and weird uh, the alien in the movie Aliens actually looks, um, it is somehow constrained to some sort of reality in order for us to believe in it. Uh, we get scared of it because it's believable, because it has flesh, it has anatomy, it has a balance point, it has gravity in it, it has uh, some weird anatomical features to it, but it does look believable. Uh, in a way that abstract artists don't um, don't do as much because they are 100% art, full on creativity with that the least uh, connection to reality. So we appreciate that in a different way. However, if some weird Picasso drawing would appear in a horror movie, I don't think people would be scared of that because they would be like, well, what is that? It doesn't really scare me. Uh, so reality needs to be, uh, connected to be believable so loads of creative quite creative artists learn a bit about scientific art in order to make their art as believable as possible but never leave creativity now for me i'm quite satisfied with this because i'm not that creative i actually love reality a lot and i love drawing what the real world gives us so not much creativity there <laughs> But thanks for the question. I really liked it. Thank you. No, thank you. Me. I'm sorry, guys. I'll have to interrupt. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to have much more time for questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have our next uh, speaker coming in soon. Uh, one favor I would ask you would be to take a couple of photos, um, if you feel comfortable with it. Uh, Davina, could you uh, stop the sharing of the yes. screen? Okay, thank you. And then I would ask you to uh, turn on your cameras if you feel comfortable and we would take a photo of our faces and then a photo showing the wolves that you made. Oh yeah, I, I would really <laughs> love, look guys, uh, there is one thing I would really <laughs> love you to do if it was possible. Um, I'm going to post a, uh, I'll, I'm going to make a post in my Facebook page about this event. And if you could put your wolves on the replies, I would really be happy. Actually, I'm going to work on that right now. Um, so if you could then put your wolves there, I would be really, really, really happy. If you manage to put the wolves and your face at the same time, that's even better. Make a video. Oh, look at you all. Oh. <laughs> I have a wolf over there.
Ok, obrigada. Uh, <laughs> Já foi? Ah, eu nem vi. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, you can't really see it. Uh, it's snapshots. Oh, um, <laughs> take another one, take another one. Oh, that wolf has blushed. <laughs> ok, one more and I'm counting down to three and everybody poses, ok? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, one, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> okay, it's done. Thank you. <laughs> so, so please, guys, go to my Facebook page. I will post there the wolf, and please post all your lovely wolfies. I <laughs> loved you all. I love doing this. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, everyone from Apex, or do you say A P E C S? Uh, no, I say know. Apex. Apex. <laughs> <Too> okay. <much> <laughs> uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It was really fun, really a lot of fun. So please. Yeah, thanks a lot, Devin. I think everybody loved it. Uh, I I'm it to did. myself, but I'm pretty sure everybody loved it. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Thanks. you all. Thanks. Bye.